Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we will be talking about the challenges of aging in America with our special guests, Suzanne Anderson, Executive Director of Age of Central Texas in Austin, Texas, Remus Jason, uh, Executive Director of Presbyterian Senior Services, PSS, in New York, and Linda Levin, uh, CEO of Elder Source in Jacksonville, Florida. So thank you so much for joining us. It's just wonderful to be talking about aging in America, and particularly with over 52 million Americans over 65, and almost a third of those are economically insecure. We're looking at a real increase over the next 40 years, uh, both in raw numbers and, and percentages. So we thought we would go around the table and just sort of talk about the views from these different parts of the country which are kind of intersecting, but also kind of unique in each in each area of the country, right, Suzanne? Oh, absolutely. Um, I can tell you that Central Texas is is quite unique. We've experienced really dynamic and rapid growth within the Central Texas area. We have the second fastest growing population of older adults, 65 plus in the country. So obviously that really puts us in squarely in the bullseye of making sure that we are focused on direct care and what services are needed. You know, Age of Central Texas has six programs of direct support. We have the only two licensed adult day healthcare in the Central Texas area. And that is an industry that really needs focus and growth. Um, Through what we do, we have focused on thought leadership within our community. And so we're discovering all kinds of incredible information about our caregivers and what's needed. You know, a lot of it is is typically what we know. We know that our older adults want to uh, age in place. And that is a, I think, a cross section of our our older adult population. We know that 9% of them um, live below the poverty level, um, which is, you know, again, meeting the needs of those individuals. And uh, I'm gonna share more about that later, but I really feel very passionate about that. You know, we also know that our caregiving community, that when you when you, we did a survey of caregivers and older adults in our community, the half of the folks that we surveyed never did not believe that they were ever going to be caregivers in their lifetime. And we know that that is not a reality, that 70% of those individuals surveyed will end up being caregiving. So we have to prepare those individuals to take on that role and responsibility um, as they have to with either their parent or their uh, their spouse. And so we're really focused on changing language, changing perception, making sure that there's an understanding around what's going to be needed for the future to create an environment within our community that both serves the mental, the physical, and what I call mind, body, and soul of our older adult and caregiver community. And aging in place is a real is a real challenge in a place like New York, isn't it, Remus? Well, it is and it isn't. And, and um, so PSS, we're located in New York City. We, we're a multi-service nonprofit. So we operate uh, 10 senior centers. Uh, we have several senior apartments. We built the first building built specifically for grandparents raising grandchildren. Uh, we have a caregiver program where we help families who are struggling to care for, with somebody, for somebody with uh, memory loss or is chronically ill. Um, and we have a, a number of other programs. I think the, the beauty of New York City is, in a lot of respects, it is an easy place to age in place in that um, the services are all here. They're readily accessible. There's public transportation, probably one of the best public transportation systems in the world. There's a pharmacy, a 24-hour pharmacy on every corner. The healthcare systems are, are very robust here. So in a lot of ways, it's a perfect place for older adults to uh, grow old. And, um, and then the numbers are showing it. Uh, the population is uh, uh, projected to, to continue to increase o- over the coming decades, where one in four uh, New Yorkers will be uh, an older adult. You make a really great point, right? The logistics of, of a concentrated city. Um, uh, make certain things uh, uh, really easy. Of course, the expense of, of uh, New York also is a factor. Uh, so I guess these, these, these kinds of factors really even, even out, right? I mean, you have right. in, in Central Texas, um, you're serving a uh, population that uh, probably doesn't look that much different than uh, the population that we must serve, Suzanne. 
but then you also have the the issue of distance, right? That is correct. Affordability is also in Austin is also a question as well. And um, uh, Linda, can you give us the the view from Jacksonville? Sure. Thank you, Mark. So uh, I'm in Northeast Florida, where the Area Agency on Aging and Aging and Disability Resource Center, we cover seven counties. Uh, What's interesting about our region is we are both urban, suburban, and rural. And um, we get to experience all of those challenges that come with those settings. So, uh, but I moved here from Miami-Dade and Broward County in South Florida. And, you know, I know very well the urban challenges, the, the, the um, values that are, that, that are there too, the things that we value, the diversity, the convenience of things, things that we don't necessarily have in our rural counties. Um, and each do present unique challenges. Um, we, we've seen during COVID though, especially not just during COVID, but especially during COVID is that no matter where you are, whether you're deep in the city or out in a rural area, you're isolated, you're lonely. And um, we see that, we've seen that quite a bit. Um, We see that particularly among the LGBTQ older adults that they could be smack in the city, uh, surrounded by people, but they're isolated and they're lonely. And um, we're seeing that with mainstream straight older adults with COVID, um, where they're surrounded but lonely. We did a series with uh, with the Jacksonville uh, LGBTQ uh, Center, and they were also talking about um, as as LGBTQ uh, adults uh, age that yeah. that sort of loneliness really really um, comes home to roost. So you have programs um, that reach out. Let's talk. Let's go around the room, starting with you, Linda, and um, let's talk about how we deal not only with the physical needs of nourishment and so on, but also those social needs. How do you uh, fight that loneliness? Um, and particularly with COVID where in-person contact, particularly in hot spots, um, can be uh, very uh, dangerous. Um, and uh, the whole situation with masking in Florida and so on uh, and in Texas, um, how do you deal with that? So during COVID, we and our contracted service providers really had to pivot all of our services from in-person to virtual. Meals, you can't really do virtual meals. So we uh, changed our meals from senior centers and dining sites to drive throughs and pickups um, to at least keep people nourished. And then we added people to the home delivered meals which is in and of itself a challenge. The, um, when you talk about some of the biggest challenges we faced, the numbers of people we've had to serve during this very difficult time um, and are still on our roles that we have to serve because now we know they have needs. They were, no, they were not known to us before. But in terms of other services to address loneliness and, and isolation, like Suzanne, uh, technology played a big role during COVID. Um, from using the television with a plug-in that allows them to interact and do activities, but also interact with people and family members and, and um, telehealth even through that platform. The tablets, uh, we have area agencies on aging in Florida who are using the tablets, um, doing computer-based uh, programming with older adults and caregivers, um, introducing Physical activities doing uh, using the technology was interesting, but people loved it. And even something as basic as using the telephone and all of our providers and our agency doing telephone reassurance, just weekly conversations just to keep them engaged. Uh, so those are some of the things we've done here, not just in my region, but throughout Florida, all the area agencies. So Suzanne, New York early on during the initial COVID outbreak had this um, this real catastrophe in terms of COVID spreading through um, through uh, homes for the aged. Um, and it was underreported. The governor, the new governor there has, has uh, boosted the COVID death rate uh, in New York by six, I think 16,000. Uh, or 12,000 to, to reflect that. Um, vectors of transmission are, are a big issue, right? When, when they're physical contact, how are you dealing with um, the, um, the attempt to um, reduce feelings of isolation, 
but also not increasing the risk for, of contracting COVID through uh, transmission and personal contact. Yeah, and very similar to Linda. I mean, I think we all struggled uh, at the onset of COVID and we sh shut down our adult day health centers immediately just because of, you know, there are so many unknowns. We're all waiting through the same questions um, and we pivoted to virtual services. Um, so regardless, we lost all of our own income, at, at, you know, with that shutdown. But the, again, that connectivity uh, to try to reduce the isolation. Isolation is is equal to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. That's the health implications for being isolated. And so across the board, we implemented um, virtual services for all of our, regardless, caregiving, support. Um, we did group uh, virtual, we learned how to use Zoom very quickly and other uh, online uh, services. We also realized that there's a huge digital divide between uh, socio socioeconomically um, challenged older adults and those that uh, possibly were living in an assisted living setting that had the capability and financial advantages of being able to own a tablet. And so we created um, through a, a program called Senior Connect. And through grant funding, we've been able to uh, give a free tablet to individuals, help them with low cost internet and five hours of virtual training online in order to connect them with their families. You know, we told them with COVID, stay at home, but order your groceries online, get your, you know, get your medication, stay connected. And yet um, folks couldn't afford to actually be able to do that. Plus, you have a great resource, right? I mean, your seniors, amongst those seniors are people who understand technology and they can they can uh, help others, right? That's uh, right. Are you finding that, I mean, one of the things that, that we have to make sure that we understand is that the people that we're serving have so many capabilities themselves, right? And, and they're volunteering for others. Are you finding that in your constituents, you have in, in the people you serve a resource that you tap into? Absolutely. We have a, a, an actual computer lab prior to COVID that was doing face-to-face -face classes with older adults. It was older adults teaching older adults how to use computer, everything from advanced tech, uh, photography to just basic computer skills. And there's, a, there's just this nuance to being able to teach an older adult um, things that they may be um, really fearful of, of touching and, and, and getting involved with. So when we pivoted to the Senior Connect program, we had a rich resource of trainers who were um, skilled at teaching and alleviating the, the kind of the fear of trying this new uh, pro program. And we have changed the life, truly changed the lives of those adults that have been able to get involved. Uh, Rilis, you are you finding this the, the same thing in New York? Oh, for sure. Just similar to what Linda and Suzanne just shared, we too pivoted uh, to a virtual uh, platform. And, and luckily we had one in place that was called PSS Life University, where we did a lot of in-person activities as well as online. Uh, but we actually managed to be one of the one of the organizations that happened to thrive during this pandemic. Um, over the in the midst of the pandemic, over the last in one year period, we we switched to totally virtual programming, offered 553 events over a, a one year period, and reached over 6,000 different New Yorkers. So that managed to take us to an an entirely new uh, level uh, because we're going to continue that uh, virtual programming. Uh, people seem to enjoy it. They, they, uh, they are able to connect and connect with one another. And um, we also too, were about to, uh, right before the pandemic hit, we were going to survey all of our members. And so we implemented a survey early on uh, at the first few months of the pandemic. And we found that while a lot of people still struggled with access to the internet, access to Wi-Fi, the ability to pay for that service, uh, there were a lot of people that had technology, they had smartphones, they had tablets, et cetera, you know, laptops, computers. But what we also, and they most reported that they're relatively um, comfortable using it. They felt they were very capable. But when asked if they were comfortable doing anything new, and, and that was our assumption. Only about one out of five felt comfortable doing anything new. So right away, even uh, while the pandemic was going on, we started to link these people to 
custom one-on-one personalized kind of training. We reached out to two digital partners to provide that one-on-one digital training so that they could increase their capacity to connect, use the, use the tools to connect with family, get on Zoom, uh, FaceTime, et cetera, and WhatsApp is popular, um, to, but actually start to using those tools so they wouldn't be as isolated as, um, as uh, many of were finding you know, during this unfortunate circumstance. I love what you're saying, using a crisis as an incitement mechanism to reinvention right? To expanding your programs. And these are not, you're not going to fall back, Remus, right? You're going to, you've learned some things about what you can put on. You become a media organization, a communication and education, a technology organization. So you're evolving. Are you changing uh, your staffing plans and the competencies that you bring on board as a result? Yes. I, I, you know, I think, I think Churchill said never let a good crisis go to waste, but I think if, if we're not as an organization, I think this is true of all the nonprofits uh, is if you don't come away from this experience transformed, then you're really doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. And, and there's, we're not going back to what, what, where we were before Uh, that's impossible. So I think uh, as a nonprofit, you know, we owe it to our constituents to figure out how to optimally, capitalize on, on, on what we've learned and, and um, um, start implementing those kinds of programs that seem to be very effective that we learned, uh, you know, as a result of this pandemic. Does this extend into uh, partnerships that you've developed? Because uh, I know PSS uh, has a diversified set of services beyond uh, elder care. Linda, are you uh, developing other partnerships where um, where other organizations that provide other types of services collaborate with you in service to your community and allow your community to serve others? Oh, absolutely. We, all of our area agencies on aging and service providers in Florida um, have to collaborate with partners and we've all identified new partners during this time. Um, collaboration is one of our core values at Elder Source. So it's what we've always done. Um, but they're definitely new providers that we've not used before, new partners, a transportation provider who does transportation for a profit, stepped up during COVID to help us deliver shelf-stable food and supplies that we got from FarmShare for the first time. We were never doing this before. We had to learn how to, I was running a warehouse I never ran before. So it was great though. Um, the partner stepped up and now we, we do have these new partnerships to tap into for any other needs that we might have that we weren't, that we weren't aware of before. I think on the technology piece, what's important and um, Suzanne and, and Remus alluded to this is we need to have a variety of tech to use with older adults, ranging from low tech to high tech. Some definitely can do high tech. I think of my own parents. My, my mom is on laptop, uh, WhatsApp, Facebook, all that stuff. My dad still has the old flip phone. You know, my mom's got the smartphone. You know, so we have to be able to address both. So the, using the telephone, is it's technology. Um, using that to communicate and helping people, the television, that plug-in that converts it to an interactive tool that they can use. Some people just want to use that. Um, and to those who use laptops and tablets is having that variety, both because of their ability, but also because of cost and accessibility. And we might be able to provide someone with a tablet, but they might not be able to afford the internet service, or it might not even be in some of our counties available yet, believe it or not. So I think that's key. That's one thing we learned in all of this and being able to respond to these um, these new needs that we're seeing. Um, I'm very interested in knowing how everybody is navigating the, the various risks that we're confronting today um, with uh, COVID and, and care of elders. In our, in our uh, small company, what we've decided is that um, in America, we don't force anybody to do anything. Um, and so what we've decided to do is we've said um, we can conduct anybody who can conduct business via Zoom remotely, no vaccinations, no masks, fine. Um, if you're not vaccinated and uh, you have a problem with masking up, you cannot 
represent the firm meeting in person with anybody, um, either with each other, with colleagues, or with other people we're serving because we do not want to be a vector of transmission to our clients and, and our clients serve the most vulnerable as well. So that's our policy, right? Nobody's lost their job. Nobody's been forced to do anything, but there are certain restrictions that have to do with respecting others. Um, Suzanne, how are you dealing with, with this and Remus and, and Linda? Because, you know, in this country, everybody's been making mistakes, right? There's no correct answer. How do we deal with this, uh, Suzanne? You know, we went, I think, to the very conservative end of the spectrum in terms of, you know, masks on. We locked our building down. Um, only our tenants can come in. Uh, we are only at about 30 percent capacity within our um, adult day health centers because we want to make sure that um, they have a separation gap between them. We've got plexiglass between um, those individuals. Um, we also had a vaccine clinic that we were able to put together at both our facilities for our older adults and caregivers with dementia because it's very difficult to take someone on the dementia spectrum to stand in line to get a you know, vaccines, we're able to bring it to them. So we've been very fortunate to have all of our staff vaccinated and, and including our older adults and caregivers that are participating in our face-to-face -face programs. That's that, That's just great. I, I, uh, Remus, I'm gonna go, go over to you, but before uh, we do this, um, uh, we asked two polls. Uh, the first poll was uh, how many uh, people thought that in America, the top, one of the top three uh, priorities ought to be care of elder care of our elders. Two thirds of those answering, over two thirds, felt like that was one of the top three priorities. And we just completed another poll, and we said, "What do you think are the uh, biggest is the biggest challenge for older Americans?" And it was interesting. Lack of affordable support and in-home care options uh, was closely followed by a healthcare system that would give it uh, difficult to access and and uh, very expensive. And then there were a couple of other answers, including uh, mental health and, and social isolation. Um, so it seems to track with a lot of the purpose of your organization and the services that you that you provide. Uh, Remus, could you um, cover the, the the question of how you navigate this this COVID situation in your operations? Well, when the pandemic first hit, we obviously shut down. Uh, we started doing grab and go, and then shut down entirely, and started to. Um, prepare, uh, work with our clients, making wellness calls over the phone, connect them uh, online if possible, and make sure they got food delivered to their homes. And mm -hmm. the numbers of people that the, the aging network started to serve uh, increased dramatically because of that, because all of a sudden you found all the isolated individuals who really had nowhere else to turn. So, but then our centers started to open up this past July and again, we're, we're slowly phasing in as we increase the number of part participants allowed, you know, in terms of uh, participating in various events. Uh, we started out just doing exercises only outdoors. We started to bring those in indoors, et cetera. We started to increase the number of people who could be in a room at any given time. But right now it's pretty, pretty stringent. And, and I, I like that. Uh, everyone has to wear masks. Uh, all employees of funded organizations have to either be vaccinated or uh, submit a proof of a negative PCR test um, every, on a weekly basis that's not over uh, 72 hours old. So either you're vaccinated or you're getting weekly tests um, and uh, you can't report to work without that. Um, and that's been working really well. And, and I think our, our constituents appreciate that. They feel safer knowing that they're going to the center Everyone's going, everyone's going to be wearing a wear a mask, and everybody is being tested and or vaccinated. It's it's incredibly important when you can become a vector of transmission for the most vulnerable, isn't it, Linda? Um, are are you doing similar things uh, in in your neck of the woods in Florida? Yeah, similar. So in Florida, as an area agency on aging, all the area agencies on aging, we don't do direct service. So we contract out those services to local providers. What we do do is we manage those contracts. So I have the staff who do all that. And we also have our helpline and um, a volunteer program. We went 100% remote uh, back in mid-March of 2020. I can't believe it's been that long. And um, we are still remote. And um, our helpline is has been very effective um, 
being able to provide information referral, being able to do telephone assessments and manage the waiting list for the different programs. So we are continuing with that. If staff have to come into the office for any reason, they are masked, they are screened. We have copies of vaccine cards. We have not mandated the vaccine. Um, we have, again, but we're not delivering direct service to seniors in our building. And the majority of our staff, almost 100 percent, except for a handful, are not even in the building at all. That's different from our provider agencies who do the meals and the senior center activities and the in-home services. And again, we have seven counties. So it varies county by county, provider by provider. I know of one uh, adult daycare, 100 percent of their staff are vaccinated and they require their clients to come in 100% vaccinated or they can't come back. Um, other centers, senior centers, meal sites, some are doing meals and activities, um, but socially distanced, having people masked and um, others are open, but lower capacity and not serving meals at the center. They're just doing activity where people could be socially distanced and then sending them home um, with the meal, with the food. So it varies from area to area, but everyone is doing, um, is practicing the best uh, protections that they can. Lots of people we provided with providers, the PPE they needed. Our challenge really, we have two, uh, probably similar to your other two areas, uh, Suzanne and Remus, is the in-home services, um, clients who didn't want someone coming into their home and workers who didn't necessarily want to go into home. So we have a workforce shortage. Um, and that is a huge challenge for us to be able to provide those services in the home. Well, you know, yeah. we just got a question on that. Uh, Jolyn Walker, who always uh, contributes such and such great questions. She, uh, she mentioned um, high pay, sometimes hazardous working conditions or, or um, uh, in which uh, people are worried about getting infected. Um, uh, the the idea of of having a high skill, but for a constrained um, uh, amount of money because mm -hmm. of how the economics of this sector work. Um, how do you deal with that? Are you are you experience uh, uh, experiencing a labor shortage? And Linda, if you could just continue to expound on what you're experiencing there, and then we'll go to Remus and then Suzanne. So our providers definitely did. They are experiencing a workforce issue um, just because of COVID and even before COVID, um, one of my counties butts up against Orlando. So they're competing with uh, that industry that pays very well there, the tourist industry, and they couldn't keep home care workers necessarily. But at the same time now with COVID, just that alone has created a problem. And providers have had to be creative in being able to entice workers to come, to stay, um, and work with clients. Uh, we never stopped providing services in the home, but it was just ever more challenging. And the it's training is so important, right? I mean, the, the, the fact is you, you just can't, I, if I walked in off the street, right, Remus, I would have to, I mean, you would probably put me to work, sure, but, sure. but you would have to help me understand how do we uh, serve your clients in your facility, right? Right. Training is going to be key. And I, I think um, I think the biggest uh, challenge right now, uh, particularly with the home care uh, industry, is the uncertainty that exists with regards to uh, everything, whether half these people um, have families. So they're trying to deal with an uncertain school situation, um, uncertain you know, um, job environment situation in terms of what what. They're going to be mandated to do what we're expected to do, et cetera, and not necessarily sure um, uncertainty in terms of the home situations they're entering. So especially now with the, the Delta variant and the changing numbers and the uncertainty regarding policy and, and protocols at schools and employers, et cetera, it's really going to be challenging, um, and particularly, I think, for the home health care industry. Mm -hmm. We asked a question, Suzanne. I'm sorry. Uh, go ahead. No, sorry. I was going to say, I think one of the challenges with the workforce, the fact that we're already having a workforce shortage, and then do we or don't we require vaccines, um, is what happens if we do and then people don't stay. And then we add to that workforce shortage. Um, we just make it that much worse. 
At the same time, but we have people serving vulnerable adults. So it's finding that balance um, when serving people. It's not an easy place to be. Suzanne, we just uh, completed our, the third, the last of, uh, of, of the three polls. And I want to set this up for you. And then we'll just uh, go around the room one more time because we're coming to the end of our time. Uh, we said uh, Social Security redistributes well from those who are younger, more prosperous to older, needier people. That's basically what Social Security was about. And without it, there would be a 4x increase in elder poverty. So the question was, should the Social Security system, so we, we, we provided a number of different options, be phased out and made optional, privatized, uh, be retained unchanged in terms of funding and forced to live within its means, right? which means that the funding stays stable, but the programs need to be constrained as costs have spun out of control. The third item is have funding increased through taxes, fees, and so on and so forth to, to meet the current need, or just receive more funding to address, you know, basically reallocating um, amounts. Uh, 64% said actually fund Social Security through increased taxes uh, to meet its obligations. Um, and 21% said just uh, reallocate funding. Uh, over. So uh, perhaps not increasing taxes, but reallocate funding. Suzanne, how do you see in, in uh, Central Texas this whole issue of our communal obligation to support our elders? Uh, it's a tough, tough issue because it is absolutely true that those people who are younger and those people who have more would see a part of their income go to people who they don't know. So how do you how do you see this as we go around the room? What is our obligation as a uh, as a country uh, to our older people who uh, don't have the ability to earn for themselves? We've debated this a lot internally. Uh, I will say a couple of things. One, it's it's not affordable any longer. You can't you know assisted living, memory care, skilled nursing are not affordable for most adults. The median uh, income for an older adult in the United States is around $43,000. The way that we can help provide for them is to expand Medicare, to include adult day health services and other lower income opportunities for older adults and to expand Medicaid. Um, so I know it was a social security question in, in, yes, it's exceptionally, I, I think that debate, I'm not going to jump in with both feet, but I can tell you that those two programs, if we're able to uh, expand those, those would be impactful to our older adults that are at that medium or low income area. And those are the folks that really need the help. So we should treat older adults in America as we would treat older adults in our family who don't have that's what that's that's basically your answer. Remus, what's your answer? Yeah, I don't disagree. I, I think it's important to protect Social Security. I mean, it's the safety net that everybody's relying on that they've invested in. Uh, and, and and it really does not take much to make sure it can be sustained and be there reliably. So I don't necessarily buy into the argument that we have to pit younger populations to with older populations and, and generations. Um, be, because I think minor tweaks and changes to how it's uh, funded um, is something that this country can do. And it's a promise that we should keep. And because so many people need to rely on it, um, we don't want to necessarily see any major changes to it. Linda? Yes, I agree both with Suzanne and I love the point you raised and, and with Remus as well. You know, I, I forgot who said it because so many people have said it. You know, our country will be judged based on how we care for the most vulnerable and the most needy, our elderly and our youth, our children. And we, you can't pick one over the other uh, if we're going to be a civil society. And, I, you know, I don't think getting rid of Social Security is an answer. I don't think shrinking it down is an answer. I don't know what the answer is in terms of how to sustain it. But I know shrinking it or getting rid of it really is not an option because all that will do is shift the burden to someplace else. Because folks, you need that to sustain. And sometimes that's all it is. And it's keeping them alive and it's keeping them in their homes, out of facilities, because 
Otherwise, if they did not have that income, they're going to end up somewhere, whether on the street or in a long-term care facility that's far more costly to our country and to the workers that are you know, wondering about whether they should be taxed more or contribute more to Social Security. Yeah, I mean, I, I basically agree at the at the fi- in the final analysis, if we could um, if we could find a, um, a free ride and somebody else would take care of uh, uh, of our problems, that would be wonderful. But that never happens. Right. It all comes down to us. So what are we going to do? Are we going to uh, take people who don't have a choice, who have contributed all their lives and, and throw them on the street, or are we going to suck it up and and meet our own obligations, our own promises? Uh, thank you so much for sharing your uh, wisdom, the work of your staffs, your boards, your contributors, uh, your volunteers, and your community, because your community is is uh, is empowered to solve its own problems, and and uh, people are are. Uh, are helping themselves um, as as you help them. Suzanne Anderson, Executive Director of Age of Central Texas, Remus Jason, Executive Director of Presbyterian Senior Services, PSS, um, providing services to a whole range of different uh, communities. And Linda Levin, CEO of Elder Source in Jacksonville, Florida, thank you so much for sharing the work that you do. Thank you so much for contributing. And stay safe. Stay safe. Thank you. Well, thanks for hosting thank you. us, Mark. Have a great day.